Hi, my name is Robin, and I'm a... No matter what you're going no through, man, you, going through, you always got to keep your head up. This you right here is right exclusive, life, man, you know from your boy, Young Shadow. No matter how hard it is, no matter how things might turn out, you got to keep your head up. No matter what you're going through. Life 
that's trying to hold you down, but you gotta stand tall, don't ever play around, uh, I wanna say big ups to all the single mothers and fathers out there, that's holding it down, and for all the lonely kids out there, I wanna tell you what's up, Hey. For real, I understand how you feel That's why I made this song for you So keep your head up Even though that I know that you fed up Never give up You know life keep going and going So stay strong, stay strong No matter what you're going through No, I agree with you 100%. There's actually, I think, about three states now, maybe four, that legalize marijuana, one of them being Colorado, the other one being Alaska. And then our backyard, Washington, D.C., has legalized marijuana. And I think it's interesting because, you know, right where these laws are being made, they legalize something like marijuana where they're saying, hey, you can't, you know, do marijuana in the street, but you are legally, you can do it inside your home. And then you start to think, well, why would, you know, people approve that? And I think the one word for that is simply taxes, money. The government has a high levy, high taxes on marijuana. And Colorado being the first state that did this, the government made millions and millions of dollars in taxes for legalizing marijuana. And the truth of the matter is I feel money, unfortunately, you know, you hear that saying the root of all evil definitely holds a factor in why certain things are done. I mean, we can also talk about alcohol. You know, alcohol was at one point illegal in the United States. And, you know, during a certain time, the government said, okay, we're going Would you say, Ms. Cheryl, that's the more dangerous substances? I think I'm just immoral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we could definitely talk about the government and, and, you know, their influences and how they affect different things in society. You know, I mean, they are the government. You know, we're, we're the only species that have to pay taxes to live, you know, on the earth. I mean, human beings in general. And, you know, the government collects this money, and, of course, they say they use it for all of the different things we have, you know, being that, you know, public services, schools, police departments, and other things that, you know, for us to really research and figure that out would be pretty, you know, extensive. So, you know, I can understand what people are saying with the government being immoral, because unfortunately things do occur. So, you know, with that said, moral, we all have a moral obligation. If we see somebody, you know, for example, there was an accident that took place across the street 
and people are hurt, you know, our moral obligation is to try to help that person if possible, you know, if, if you're in a situation where you can't. For example, you're trained as a nurse or a doctor. You don't want to just drive right by when you just see a pretty serious accident because you can actually make the difference between someone living and someone dying, you know. Also, the question is, you know, I'll throw another scenario. What happens if you see somebody getting robbed? Do you intervene? Do you stop what you're doing? You see this person, somebody trying to take a person back. Do you go and you intervene to try to stop that person knowing that it's very possible that you can get hurt or even killed? I mean, I have to throw that out there. Killed for respecting or doing what you should morally do as a, as a good person. You know, yeah. today people are even afraid to drive people places because there have been situations where someone is stranded in the street. You feel as a moral person, as a good person, you want to go ahead and drop this person somewhere where they'll be safe, and then negative things happen to you or your family by taking this person to one place or another and the person actually turning on you. So um, more obligate. I'm sorry, go ahead. And also sometimes there are um, liabilities um, um, that are that that are, can be um, you know put upon you when you take on the responsibility. So um, it's real can be tricky. Yeah. Again, we are having a discussion and we are giving information, having a discussion, not advice. And so, if anyone is experiencing some of these things, you want to make sure that you look up and follow any local um, ordinances, laws, and policies, and blah blah. Go ahead. Oh, and then, then yeah. uh, if you want to join the uh, discussion, please join us and call in again at 857-232-0159 and the pin 473-012. Thank you, Robin. Also, like, she, like Robin just mentioned, liabilities, very important. You know, a lot of people don't want to take on certain moral responsibilities because of the liabilities that may occur. Uh, I read a situation at one time where there was a, a house intruder that actually jumped through the roof of a person's house and literally landed and broke their leg. The owners of the house woke up, saw them there. They called the police and subsequently the guy got arrested. But then he also went ahead and he sued the house owner for, you know, him getting his leg broken. And you say, well, wait a minute, you were trespassing. But there are loopholes and things to certain rules that can actually allow a person to be able to do things like that. And unfortunately, because of our legal system, these different things can go into the justice system. And sometimes these people who are immoral, in other words, not doing the right thing, can actually win these particular cases. And you'll be held liable for something that you say, listen, this wasn't my fault, it was out of my control, but because of certain states, certain countries, certain laws in different states and countries, these things can occur. So it can just be a really, really upsetting situation. But again, being that we're talking about moral obligation, I like to talk about what's your moral obligation as a person. And, you know, we live in the United States where, you know, all of us want, you know, life, liberty, in the pursuit of happiness. We all want to have good jobs. We want a house over our heads. We want a nice car. You know, we want the things that make us happy. And uh, Michelle, actually, and I'm going to have her go into this in a little bit, she knows the different rules or the things that most people want in life. Besides that, there are others. There are basic necessities that people need, you know, basic food, you know, place over there, a, a shelter, things like that. So we all want to have those things in life. We want to make sure that we, our basic necessities are met because once our basic necessities are met, then we can function in a society. And unfortunately, in today's society, there's a lot of people whose basic necessities are not met. One of them is being health care. Right now, President Obama has been completely ridiculed and, what is it, criticized for a health care system that actually brings more health care to people who just don't have it. And he feels he has a moral obligation to help people who cannot get medical health care, whether because they don't have jobs or the proper amount of money to be able to afford it, 
to give certain people this health care system that will help them to, you know, live better lives. In other words, certain people live to just pay for health care for them, their family, their kids. He came out with this uh, statute called Obamacare where he changed certain laws. And right now, you know, I want to say most of the people who have health care are very angry about it. They feel that he's spending way too much money and it's causing a lot of harm, unfortunately, to their pockets. I'm going to just throw that out there because it is a money thing. You know, if it was free, I don't think anybody would complain, but unfortunately, you know, any type of service is going to cost money, and especially health care being one of the most lucrative businesses out there. Billions and billions of companies are making so much money from health care. It, it can cause, you know, a lot of different issues. And I think that's probably a good topic uh, another day to discuss, you know, health care and, you know, how we as, you know, human beings pay for health care and how the whole health care system works because health care is one of those things that, you know, you have a lot of people making a lot of money off of it, and it, it, it can be considered immoral the way they're making it because certain people need drugs to live, and because they need these drugs to live, they spend an absorbent amount of money, and you literally work all your life to, you know, pay for these drugs to keep you living. And it's like how can your quality of life be good when you do certain things like that? So going back to, to values, as Michelle said earlier, we, we have, you know, everybody has a different value system, and a lot of it has to do with our upbringing. Everybody, you know, the United States is the biggest melting pot ever. You know, you have people from different countries, different areas of the world that have a lot of different sets of values. For example, you know, with uh, Asian people, they want you to look at them in their eyes. If, if you don't look at them in your eyes when you greet them, it's kind of considered a form of disrespect. And if you don't know the different value systems of the different races and different, you know, ethnicities in this country, it can actually cause for different issues. So, you know, with that said, it, it changes the game. It changes certain things that happen in society. So, Robin, you want to give that number one more time? Anybody else want to join in and, and contribute? Um, I just wanted to point out three things about what you're saying, Marcus, and what the, everyone is saying within listening. And, and then I think Pastor Alan Holt also would like to chime in about moral obligations because, again, as we identified, it, it has a lot to do with people's value system. And many a times, depending on the home a person comes out of, by depending on the teachings and the trainings and the cognitive skills that an individual has, it's going to weigh heavily, or the culture, it's, or the religion, as I said before, it's going to weigh heavily on the persuasion people hold. And many of us are obeying the law because we have to, not because we want to, but there is a side of us where moral obligations is concerned that, and I will paraphrase it in this way, do unto others as you would have them to do to you. If you want people to treat you a certain way, if you want people to care about you a certain way, if you want people to have your back, and many of us look for security in having good friends, good family, good this, good that, and so we say, well, we expect a lot from people but we don't want to give back. You know, we want people to do for us, we want people to be there for us, but we don't feel like we should have to do that. You know, reciprocity is not a, a word that many people use across the globe. And so one of the things about moral persuasion is that, and from what they're calling a theory called contractualism, um, it says it's a central claim that an act is right or wrong if and only if the act could or could not be justified to others on the grounds that they could not reasonably reject the act. So as we have mentioned a few items that recently were in the media, um, and, and, and some of these are popular ones like the Ferguson, the Trevon, it could be something as simple as um, 
200 police officers being fired in a community that really needs to have more police officers and the government, the commissioners, the mayors are saying we don't have enough money in the funding while they make a million dollars a year. And you go, what? Why, why don't they take a less salary and keep the police on force? Well, again, one of the scope of checking yourself is, is the thing I'm about to do, could it be reasonably rejected? Is it something that in the scope of the people that it's going to affect? They're going to reject it because by my action, it created something for them or it resulted in something, not necessarily that I care about, that I call um, right or wrong, but perhaps that person as a result of what I did. It was wrong. Let's take a simple case of a parent. Parents are going to have to teach your children rules and value systems, and we teach them ethical behaviors and persuasions, and we tell our children not to steal and not to lie and not to and not to, you know, so many laws. By the time a kid is two, it has been proven that they hear 500 no's. Because we love to tell them, no, don't do that, no, don't do that, no. And then when we look at our moral persuasions, we would like the children say so we're protecting them. And then we don't understand that we're teaching them to lie. We'll be fussy, fussy, and argumentative and indisciplined, and then we'll want our children to be disciplined. So again, from the contractualism perspective, am I really being moral? There are two more perspectives that we should look at from, the, from a theory perspective, a philosophical perspective, is that... Moral obligation is more highly correlated with intention, more so than attitude or social norms. So just because socially it's okay to parade in the street and burn down your neighborhood because you're unhappy about something, is it really morally your obligation to do that? How does it affect the other people around you that are not involved in that act who would rather feel civil? resolution, whose homes and lives are now destroyed long after you jump back on a plane to your city, long after you go back to your house, two women in Ferguson no longer have their business. So from a moral perspective, the intention, more so than the social norm, is what one can perceive and suggest that that act was not right. The, the third part is when we think of moral considerations, that moral considerations are necessary to predict behavioral intention in moral situations. So in other words, when I look at Cheryl and I think about Cheryl and I think about who she is, when I think about how she reacts to certain things in life, does she get so crazy that she tears up her house every time she's displeased about stuff? Does she go out and drink till she's drunk and now she's a DUI, right? From a moral consideration, I can predict that based on the intention of consistent um, destruction that she does, I can come to a conclusion that this person does not understand moral obligations to others. So if we are to truly have something in front of us, I am recommending that we look at these three in pieces. We look at, is it something that I'm about to do that others can reject? Is this something that when I put it together with something else, the intention is matched up against attitude or social norms, does it not fit? Because your attitudes and beliefs are what lead you into the decisions you make. And so if my value system is poor already, based off the norms of the society, which would be the laws and the mores and all these things, if my attitude is already bad, and what are the chances I'm going to believe in values that would include others in me? No, because I'm selfish and it's all about me and my happiness and what my opinions are and what I prefer to do and how I prefer to do it and what gratifications I get from doing it. So why do I owe Marcus anything? I don't. And this is what we see, Marcus, today, everyone in our society. It's an, a, a gratitude of self-gratification that it's excluding others in the decisions we make. And everything we do in life, I believe, affects people good or bad. 
it's somebody needs to, I don't know, we're hearing a horn blowing, but everybody I believe. I believe that everyone in life has a moral obligation, and this is one of those topics that definitely um, people need to examine themselves and say, how do I, in the scheme of life, how do I insert others? You know that there's no I in team. It's a we issue. I believe Mr. Daniel Sohn has a comment. He's burning up with fire. He has something he wants to say. So, Mr. Sohn. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just had to say this. You know, you started speaking about cities and municipalities and governments. Well, I found something very interesting. And, and you know, I didn't think about it today when we, we, we were sent the topic yet. But I mean about it. You know, there's a moral obligation bond. And for those that are unfamiliar with what a moral obligation bond, you can look it up, but I'll tell you briefly what it is. A moral obligation bond, uh, when it is, is kind of sort of a, it's a type of revenue bond issued by a municipality or a town or a uh, governmental entity. And what that means is a moral obligation bond gives the investors that the city is dealing with um, a tax exemption, um, as well as access to those benefits of that tax exemption, but it also provides those investors um, a, a kind of almost a contract, um, kind of a, an additional, like a pledge, um, kind of like a pledge of commitment against default. Um, so, so what I'm trying to, but, but, but uh, you can look it up to understand what I'm talking about. But there has been much controversy between municipalities as well as um, uh, financial advisors in the past all over the country because of the name moral obligation bond. Simply because when it's your moral obligation, you're expected to maintain and keep that relationship as committed. Now, the funny thing, this is why the argument is started and why whether this should be called a moral obligation because the intention is great when you intend to commit to something, you got to complete it. But it's, it's a funny thing um, that municipalities, um, that when they create this moral obligation bond, uh, it's said that they, 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 they add additional security. But guess what? It's not legally binding. It's not a legal um, contract between the investor and the city it's actually considered moral. So in court, it wouldn't hold up for them, even though it's on paper and it's dealing with money from a city to another agency. So even if one of the two um, parties fail to meet their moral obligation, it doesn't matter. It, it wouldn't matter legally. It's just that you said you would do it, you didn't do it. Guess what? All that money gets wasted. So, you know, there's been very lot of controversy. My point with saying that is if we're going to say what moral obligation is, we have to be very clear that moral obligation is not just, and this is my opinion, is not just um, uh, something we say. It's got to be something we follow through with. If we, are, uh, we call something if we use the word lightly and say that is my moral obligation, you can't be found doing it, doing the opposite of that. You gotta continue and be straightforward and maintain what you said is your moral obligation. Your moral obligation today cannot be your not be your moral obligation tomorrow in another place, in another environment, in another situation. I just wanted to say that. Uh -oh. We appreciate it, Daniel. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I don't know if that made any sense, but, but there's been a lot of controversy, just so you all know, between what a moral obligation bond is um, between municipalities and, and, finance and, and, and investors, um, whether that word or that, that type of, um, uh, if you will, agreement should be called a moral obligation because it's not legally binding in the court of law. And it doesn't matter. The city can give investors all this money, but they don't have to keep their side of the bargain. 
So they're commitment. And because it's not legally binding, it's considered moral. So all that money is lost. So my point with saying that, I'm going to say, clarify it again. So those listeners that didn't understand, my, my personal take on that is, and based off what I just described, is that if you are going to say something, is your moral obligation, you're going to do something for then it's got to be what you do in every situation. It can't change per situation. So if my moral obligation is to help the needy, okay, and the, the less fortunate, that means if I am falling hard times, but there's someone who's, on, who's in a worse condition than me, I cannot no longer say that that is not my obligation to help them. I need to help them because they're less more for, less fortunate than I am at the moment. So mm-hmm. that's what I that, that's what I wanted to say. That your moral that well, you can't take those words lightly. They're very serious words. No, that that makes sense, Daniel. We appreciate the comment. You know, and as we're talking here, I just wanted to bring Mr. Alan Holt on the line because he's also a pastor, and Pastor Holt can actually speak more of the godly moral values, the values that we feel we all should follow in a godly sense. Pastor, are you on the phone? I am. Thank you very much. You know, what I like to uh, contribute to the call tonight, I, I always try to get the heart of the of the presenter. You know, there, there are certain reasons why certain topics resonate and why uh, certain topics are discussed. I happen to believe that you know, things happen in our lives for a reason, that we must also be very purposeful in everything that we do. And, uh, and, and of course, God says we're going to give an account for the conversations and, and the, the discussions and the things that we, we consider. So what I like to do, um, and, and certainly I'll, I'll put a spiritual uh, spin on it, if it were, but can you say as, the, as a developer of, uh, this is to you, Mr. Dean, as a developer of this specific topic, I mean, what was the driving force behind uh, choosing this particular topic? What, what, was, what was the heart, what, was the, um, what sparked it, if it were, that you might choose such a topic such as this? Well, the real reason why I decided to choose this topic is because recently in the news, you know, we have a lot of public figures a lot of people that, you know, we look up to and that, unfortunately, in my opinion, the news usually tends to be negative. Uh, A lot of the news has resonated off the negative things that publicity artists or uh, public uh, presenters or people do. The one that strikes me right now is Bill Cosby. I'm a huge Bill Cosby fan, love him from way back. And basically, with all of these allegations of what he's been doing recently, it started me thinking like, when you're in a public eye and you have public figure, you're a public figure, now do you have a moral obligation to do certain things that you, you know, correctly? And the thing is, is that that's kind of what made me start thinking about, you know, the way some of these artists and these people that, you know, me and other people look up to, what type of obligation do they have being a public figure? So that's actually what caused me to come up with this idea. Very good. Very good. Question. As you think about that, um, are they or should they be more responsible than the average parent, than the average citizen, the average child, or the average person walking in our neighborhoods every day? Well, that's a good question because, you know, as I'm a person that has kids, I feel that I have to definitely be, you know, I have a moral obligation to be good because I am their influence. They look to me before they look at anybody else. However, they also are influenced by public figures as well. And for example, my daughter happens to love an artist called Ariana Grande, which is a new artist that came out. She's been around for a while and she's a singer, but the way she sings is great. However, she performs in a very, I don't want to use the word provocative, but in very short clothing and and she always wears these real tight fitted outfits that, you know, I'm thinking now, will my daughter now want to start wearing these type of outfits and start, you know, administering her sexuality because one of the people that she looks up to is doing it? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. I understand that quite well. And if you were to take the perspective of the person that is in 
the spotlight or always being in the public's view, they will tell you they don't want the responsibility. Mm -hmm. In fact, they will tell you that you should be the greatest contributor of values in your home with your children, so on and so forth. And as parents, because we realize that there are external pressures, that requires us to do all we can, first and foremost, to live right, to be the right example, because you know, we know that kids will do what they see us do. Yeah. Uh, So, do what I say, not what I do. But today, people don't respect that. And they will respect who you are and what you do. And as a result of that, we have the first responsibility. You know, it starts at home. It starts with me. It starts with each and every individual. And we cannot expect that other people are going to buy in to that level of belief like we, like we have. So whether or not they buy into it or not, I am going to be consistent. Whether or not uh, they love the songs of these artists and they love the videos, I am going to be consistent. And it's not until we become consistent that we actually can stand and demand uh, that there is responsibility. But it starts with us. If we're not going to be uh, consistent, we cannot expect our kids to honor it. We cannot expect society to honor it, and especially anybody that's high profile, given all the things that, you know, they have to deal with in their lives as well. So I wanted to know kind of what your, what your heart was behind it, and I really appreciate, you know, what you're saying about guys like Bill and, um, you know, other, other profile, high profile people. Do you remember, Marcus, many years ago when I know it was Charles Barkley, who I love. You know, I think he's candid. I think he's honest. Sometimes, you know, at his own expense, but he's, he's, he's a straight shooter and he's going to tell you what's really on his heart. And, and I can, I can deal with a person like that rather than the person who's deceptive, who will not be forthright and just be, you know, brutally honest with me. But he would say it. I'm not your role model. Don't look to me to be the example for your children. Dad, you be the example. Mom, you be the example. Right? Yeah. But where are we taught? Where where is a person taught moral obligation? Well, maybe you can respond to that. Where in church and unfortunately a lot of people don't go to church as much as they used to or they go to church and unfortunately they don't get that type of education. And I think Robin, you wanted to have a comment? I know you wanna probably uh, chime in on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, we listen. We send our kids to school and expect for them to come out educated, and and but we still have the responsibility. It's still our responsibility that our children come out educated, and that entails understanding what they're exposed to and all that. Which many of us parents go to, we, we can't even tell you what our children's curriculum is, and we can't even tell you what, what, the, what kind of perspective that their teachers are coming from. And, and then also with media, see, we also put our kids in front of the media with the tablets, the Xboxes, the 360s, all whatever, and then in school, I didn't know, but in school, they're giving preschoolers tablets. So there's a, a systematic dumbing down as well. And then even in the, the we, would, we would want to send people to the churches and, and for wisdom, but a lot of times, just like in the government and schools, you get the people that are giving out information um, from a slant for different agendas maybe to generate money or who knows what else, power control, who knows what else. So again, the, the ultimate responsibility, it, it does come down to, to the parent. And then when it comes to, to operating uh, moral uh, obligation or, or good character, then that still stems, it goes down to each person individually. And and even a baby, even a child, they know when they do something wrong. 
and and they will try to to either cover it up with a lie, you know, the little darlings, or they'll or they'll 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 fess up so they can get it right. But even a child, so there is that age of accountability, okay, even from 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 children's age, where there it, where we can be self accountable, you see, and and the law. Watch this. The word says the law is for the lawless. And then we have to remember, see, we go into the laws, we always go, when, when the uproar happens, well, why didn't the police do something? Why didn't the laws? But we, and, and we've got rights. Well, we have to remember, watch this, we were given a bill of rights, not given them. We, I mean, not, we don't, we, we don't, you, we were given a bill, a bill of rights. So we don't even have rights, you see? And then the, the rights that we have are to protect us from what? The government. So I'm just saying all that, not to point a slant on the government or any other agency like that, but just again, the ultimate responsibility, we have to start looking towards ourselves and not others. You know, we have to be our own models. Yeah. You know, you said something and I, you know, I laughed a little bit uh, because, you know what, and I'm not saying, again, I'm not trying to put anything on the government either, but I laughed because... I kind of agree with you. How can we, how can we expect when our own government, like I talked about the moral bond, is willing to say, well, I made a commitment to you, I signed it, but it's because I, I said it's moral, it doesn't matter that I signed a contract with you. Mm-hmm. you know? So Pastor's question, I believe, was also, you know, should we hold these public figures more accountable? Um, in a higher regard? I don't mm-hmm. think the answer is yes. I don't think the answer is no. But I think the answer is that we have the responsibility mm-hmm. to, as parents, as leaders in the community, as a, someone who sees something in their neighborhood that is wrong, but so. without yeah. passing judgment, without passing judgment or using stereotypes, I think it is our responsibility to seek out the ways that we yep. can hold those people accountable. Um, yes. Sometimes that may not be us physically doing something about it. They may be making a phone call to our local police department, you know, being vigilant. It may be, you know, not taking action ourselves. Or it may be, you know, seeing a parent uh, smack their children a little too hard, but, you know, not, not, it may, may be hey, saying, you know, mm-hmm. you know be, be, be just mindful of that. Maybe not taking action. But, 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 but I think the responsibility is on everyone, not just a specific part in your group. You know, right, like right. Said, we all know right from wrong. Definitely. So, it's it's every part of society. I'm sorry, Ms. Cheryl, did you have to say something? Uh, yeah, if, if I can just interject here, if I can just interject here. Yes. We, we have to understand where we begin as human beings when we come out of the birth canal. Values begin at home. Children discover parents' values by observing how the parents spend their most precious resources, which is their time and their money. So if a parent fills their day with work, TV, shopping, home maintenance, hanging out, talking on the phone, all of these things, then most of the time your kids are watching you and they perceive that your habits and your behaviors what you say, not being the word and your bond, the different things you believe children are not seen, they begin to pick this up as old family values. And this is what they then go out. So let's get the hierarchy properly here. A child does not go into popular culture when they're zero to five and ten. They do not get involved with popular culture when they're newborn. So the first onset or onslaught of values, moral teachings, is in the home. Children observe you, and based off what they see, not what you say, is how they begin to pick up habits. Their characteristics are formed from in the home. Once they get to a certain age, 0 to 10, after 10 years old, because they're now in school at 5, some of them are, most people are, they begin to hang with what's called their peers who have different value systems. And so as young kids in kindergarten coming up, they begin to form 
about your genders and different things because these are things that happen in different homes. Some kids believe in Santa. Some homes don't teach Santa Claus. So when the kid goes to school and says Santa Claus, my kid may say there is no such thing. <clears throat> what do you mean there is no such thing? My mom says Santa Claus is a myth. That Santa Claus is just a fairy tale because daddy is Santa Claus. How many times have your children quoted you? How many times have you heard them say, my dad says, my mother says? So you're the first thing, the first impregnation into their spirit. Then their parents started to impregnate them. And if for some reason you did not do what you were supposed to have done, because you were lying, cheating, and stealing, pretending to believe in philosophies you didn't believe in, then these philosophies get shattered when the peers challenge it. Excuse me, when the peers start saying, well, how can you know your, your folks say you can't lie, but so-and-so. Now the kids start saying, hmm, that makes a lot of sense. So now the peers start influencing them, and when the peers start influencing them, those of us who take our children to churches, and those of us who have social groups in different settings outside of family, immediate family is what I'm talking about, our children begin to observe everything around us, including what the preacher says. And when they start observing these things, if you are consistent, if you believe in the gospel, you believe in the moral compass of the Bible, then it confirms to the child what you have told them in the home. So your moral compass would be exactly what God has said in his word. But if your moral compass is strictly about the physical and not incorporating the spiritual, then the child begins to question a lot of stuff, which is why so many people by the time they get to be 15, 16, or even 17, they don't want to go to church anymore. And then parents allow it because they go, okay, force them into church. And so what happens is a progression, a progressive state. Politics has nothing to do with this. Popular culture has nothing to do with this. The reason our children are led astray is because when they were first starting out, as I said on Saturday in my class lady training, it may take a village to raise a child, but it takes a community to do a generation. And so when we forget simple rules, and simple bylaws, what happens is our children begin to question the status. They begin to try and, as it were, manipulate the rules. But if we're consistent on the beliefs that we have, not because they are norms, but they are inbred in even us, challenge yourself, everyone, in this call. How many moral things your parents told you that you still will dare today? How many parents were brought up in church that don't go anymore? How many of us were told not to curse, yet do we curse like it's out of style? How many of us were told that your role is supposed to be this, this, and we're far from what we were ever taught? So it's the same for the children. So moral persuasion begins in the family. It begins at home. And then throughout the compass, if you came up in a chaotic family, chances are your moral persuasions are chaotic. If you are brought up in a steady, steadfast home where no means no and yes means yes, then chances are you are going to be a person that's what they call the high achiever mentality, the A personality, where things have to be in order, things have to go a certain way. Most of those kind of people become scientists, go to the military, they teach, they do certain things because they were brought up in a certain way. And even though they stray, they don't go very far from what they were taught. So when we think about our children and why is it that someone has a greater impact on them than we do, chances are we used to sing songs around them that we shouldn't have. Chances are we listen to music that, that they thought, oh, and now that they've gotten bigger, they feel okay to have their own choice for music because you said it was okay to do it when they were small. They heard you saying these things. So, you know, when it comes to politics and government, the government should not have more control over your home than you. You cannot ask other people, and you cannot put your children over to other people to take charge of them because you can't do it. You know, a lot of us do that as parents. We want everybody else to be responsible for the, the negative piece, but when little Johnny gets a, a scholarship and he gets a big award, that's me. That's all me. That's what I did. But when little Johnny does something wrong, that's not me. That's dad. Dad did that. It wasn't me. And so we need as adults to take accountability for our children 
and take responsibility for the moral pieces that we're doing. Moral obligations begins with value system, and value systems begin in the home. I believe, Marcos, it is now 6.56, and we have to go to the Bible study piece, so I believe you, as the moderator and mediator of this call, have the final discussion on here. Um, and perhaps this is something I think is a dynamic topic that if we streamline it the way we have done, it's up to you, Marcus. This may be something that we want to talk some more about because this is a serious topic. It can help so many people to understand certain things and certain beliefs, but that would be up to you um, no, if you no, want to something to make it you're, you're absolutely right. Before we run off this phone call, and thanks again, Michelle, I really wanted to get Pastor to say his last word because he did ask, you know, about social, you know, how us in the home can be role models. So, Pastor, for one minute, can you just finish elaborating what you were stating? Absolutely. We have to understand that the Bible is very clear that uh, we are here to be fruitful and to multiply. In the beginning, God created us in his image and in his likeness, and he said it was good that man was functioning like he was created to function. And God, who is most responsible, produces sons who are also very responsible, who realize they have an obligation. They have an obligation to represent him in, in the highest esteem uh, so that the father might be honored in how well they live. That comes when there's a reverence of God in the lives of people. And, and many people who don't have that reverence, you know, tend to take life in their own hands and to be subject to their own rules. But there is a ruler who is greater than all rulers. There is a king who is greater than all kings. And there's a Lord who is greater than all lords. And that is the one who we serve, who has given us the right and has given us the responsibility, if it were, to represent his name well. So if we're conscious or are conscious of that reality, we will represent him in truth, we will re represent him in integrity, and we will model, we will follow Christ, and the Bible says that as we follow him, when we're following him correctly, our children and our children's children and our children's children's children will also follow Christ as they follow us who are leading them to Christ. So that is our responsibility not the responsibility of the great artists that are out there who we appreciate their work, right? But they're, they're, they're fallen men. They're not perfect in any regard. But Christ himself is perfect, and he's given us the model, so therefore we have no excuse. Um, I love the topic. I, I believe that we can continue to break great ground in this area and that if we continue it, you know, that, that there will be more fruit that will come forth from it. And the last point is that, uh, a good tree produces good fruit. That's what the word says. That a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. And that every tree that does not produce will be cut down and cast into the fire. That's what the word of the Lord said. And therefore, those that do produce his fruit, God's going to honor and it will always be fruitful and able to supply abundantly to all that are in need. Thank you for the cause. Thank you, Pastor. We really appreciate it. Now, uh, for the people left on the phone call, what, I think this is a great topic, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell everybody we will continue this conversation next week, Wednesday at 6. Um, currently, it's 7 o'clock. We're going to all go to the Bible study call. Uh, Robin, can you give that number for anybody who's listening who likes to go into Bible study, that number in 10, please? Mm -hmm. Yes, that number is da 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 or uh uh oh uh uh Oh Robin, I have it I have it if you need it. It's seven one two there it is. Yes four three two zero seven hundred. I'm sorry, I thought you had it on hand. And the pin is nine seven zero five one six pound. But I repeat it, seven one two. Four three two zero seven zero zero pin number nine seven zero five one six pound. I'd like to thank everybody for their input. Pastor Holt, Miss Cheryl, Daniel Song, 
And, of course, Robert, as always, we always, always appreciate the time. We're going to all go into the Bible study right now. But, again, next week we will be talking about more obligations, part two. And we look forward to everybody being on the call and uh, having a great, great discussion. If there's not anything else, uh, we will uh, reconvene next week. Take care, everybody, and God bless. All right, all right, everyone listening on Spreaker, stay tuned and refresh because we're going to be back in two minutes with Families in Distress Bible Study. Okay, thanks, everyone. Would you rather make your own way or spend your life saying, what if? Life is calling. How far will you go? Peace Corps. To find out more, call 1-800-424-8580 or go to peacecorps.gov. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. The deal struck between the Greek Prime Minister Cyprus and the leaders of the Eurozone has been called anything from an absolutely unavoidable compromise and the savior of the Eurozone to a surrender. Or some people have called it a complete rout on behalf of the Greek Prime Minister. Now joining us to talk about this, joining us from Athens is Natina Vagantzis. She's a sociology PhD student at New York University focusing on political economy and social movements. She's a member of the UAW Graduate Student Organizing Committee, organizing involved in the AKNY Greece Solidarity Movement. And uh, she joins us, as I said, now from Athens. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So give us your basic overview of, of, of the deal. I, I know you're not very happy about it. Why? Well, I think it's first important to note that the conditions under which this deal were made can be characterized as those of a soft coup. For five months, uh, the European Union, European Central Bank, were imposing a kind of liquidity asphyxiation on the Greek government as it was trying to negotiate in good faith. And the revelations you know, from senior members of the government, including the former finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, show that uh, the creditors weren't really interested in negotiating in good faith. Uh, so, you know, the past two weeks, but especially the past few days, were kind of an intensification of, you know, both that economic pressure, but also the political pressure uh, that the Eurozone leaders were placing on the Greek government, you know, making threats that they were going to kick it out of the Eurozone, which is something that the government was, one, not, you know, committed to and also not prepared to doing. And then the second point 